We are no longer in a series on the five choices. <laughs> okay, one more. <laughs> yeah, 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 you guys are mocking me now. <laughs> I know. There's a difference between irony and sarcasm in your laughs, and I know that was sarcasm. Uh, okay, so if you have your Bibles, um, it won't help you probably today to read along with me. Um, we're looking at Philippians chapter 3, very profound passage, and I'm going to be reading it out of the uh, message translation, so it, it may not bear similarity, so just listen, okay? <clears throat> and that's about it, friends. Be glad in God. I don't mind repeating what I've written in earlier letters, and I hope you don't mind hearing it again. Better safe than sorry, so here goes. Steer clear of the barking dogs, those religious busybodies, all bark and no bite. All they're interested in is appearances. Knife-happy circumcisers, I call them. The real believers are the ones the Spirit of God leads to work away at this ministry, filling the air with Christ's praise as we do it. We couldn't carry this off by our own efforts, and we know it. Even though we can list what many might think are impressive credentials, you know my pedigree, a legitimate birth, circumcised on the eighth day, an Israelite from the elite tribe of Benjamin, a strict and devout adherent to God's law, a fiery defender of the purity of my religion, even to the point of persecuting Christians, a meticulous observer of everything set down in God's law book. The very credentials these people are waving around as something special, I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash, along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life. Compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master firsthand, Everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant, dog dung. I've dumped it all in the trash so that, what I, so that I could embrace Christ and be embraced by Him. I didn't want some petty inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. I gave up all that inferior stuff so I could know Christ personally, experience his resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering, and go all the way with him to death itself. If there was any way to get it, to get in on the resurrection from the dead, I wanted to do it. I'm not saying that I have this all together, that I have it made, but I'm well on my way, reaching out for Christ who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all this, but I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. Amen. So Lord, teach us. Teach us from your word. Teach us how we might live, how we might respond to you and respond in our world and, uh, and press on to you. That's our need today. That's our that's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, this passage is very profound to me because, um, to me, it brings together so many elements of the whole Bible, and it's interesting that um, it starts out with a challenge that most of my life I found uh, difficult, if not impossible. It starts out by calling us to joy. To rejoice in the Lord. And I just, I never had that as a natural thing. You know that? It, it was something that I could fake, I could pretend, but I never knew it that much, you know, because of my uh, negativity and just my weird personality and depression and stuff. And so I would leave that part off and then study the rest of the passage. But um, I think that that's missing out because um, if we're going to have joy in our lives, we've got to come to grips with what it is we're aiming towards and what it is we're turning away from. If we get mixed up in that and we're turning away from the wrong things, we're turning toward the wrong things, then there'll be no joy. But when, but when we, our focus is right and, and we discover that, that Christ is already reaching out to us and pulling us toward him, 
then there's a freedom and there's a joy in the lightness, in spite of whatever circumstance or weird personality uh, you might have, or I might have. And, uh, and it actually goes together. Now, this passage was probably really hysterical uh, when it was first written in, the, in the, the Greek. And I wanted to point out, I got in big trouble. This is the first sermon I've ever gotten in huge trouble in down in California. Um, they're still bitter about it. Um, <laughs> I'm not even remembering it. Yeah. Uh, because Paul in this passage is talking about the people who would um, go by appearances and credentials. And uh, it's kind of like you know, Chris Christopherson's uh, famous insight that everybody's got to have somebody to look down on. Somebody doing worse than them at any time at all. Someone doing something dirty, decent folks can frown on if you don't have anybody else to help yourself to me. Remember that great <laughs> insight from the theologian. Now, Paul would travel from town to town and preach the gospel and preach about grace and mercy and forgiveness and joy. And then a group of people would follow along behind him going, nah, 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 that's not it, that's not it. We got his, here's how you really do it. And Paul doesn't know. And so uh, he, could, he called them barking dogs. That they just kind of rah, 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 going after him and, and turning people away from Christ and turning people away from grace and from, from joy. The, the part I got in trouble with was down here further where he says, I compare um, all of that reputation and credentials and personal uh, achievements. And in most Bibles, it says, I consider it loss, right? And, and in the Greek, the word is skubala, which means dog poop. And, and I said that in California in a sermon, <laughs> thinking I was quoting the Bible, <laughs> and that didn't matter. And so we can't say that in church. So those of you watching on the video, we're not saying that. <laughs> However, this is the only Bible translation that actually does it right. And it's saying, and, and here's why they all laughed. It was so terrible, because he started out saying, these people are like barking dogs. And what they leave behind is dog droppings. <laughs> and then people read that letter and they got so hysterical. Oh, that's so funny. We never got it because of our translations. And so we never knew that this was hysterical back uh, at the time. So now you know that. Now here's the deal. <laughs> Have you ever been around people? You're feeling pretty good about yourself and then you're around somebody and they just have a way of making you feel terrible about yourself? Yes. <laughs> I don't want testimonies. That's 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 next week. <laughs> you know, you just you get around them and they just have a way that you feel worse or less or dumber or weak or something, you know. And and I had that yesterday. We we had a fabulous lunch. Pam invited us to go to um Palisades, beautiful restaurant out on the water with Hazel Larson and Eileen and I and her before. And we had a great, wasn't that a great time? It was fabulous. It was fabulous. It was a beautiful, the sun even came out for, you know, a second and a half. And we're there and, and good conversation and good friends. And, and, it was, and I was feeling so good. And so we drove home and I was dressed nice. I looked almost as good as Walt Gustafson. <laughs> Not possible, but almost, I said, you know. But, um, you know, I was, I was dressed okay, right? Appropriately. Handsome as could be. Handsome as could be, thank you. Okay, so, so some people are delusional, but the thing is, so we're driving home, and we live in uh, Shoreline, like many of you do, only we live in Ennis Arden, which is a small private community in Shoreline, right? Which says we're better than everybody else. And so, um, We've never found the clubhouse for Innes Arden, but we've always been told if you live here, there's a clubhouse and there's events and things and go and, and go find it. So we drove in and there was a sign saying that yesterday was the Innes Arden annual garage sale. And Eileen said, you know, before we go home, we're dressed up and everything. Let's go find the clubhouse and visit the garage sale. And we did. And I drove all over for about an hour and found it. And uh, <laughs> We went in and, and, and I got a, uh, for $5, I got a, a meat slicer so that when we start doing deli service here at the church, 
five bucks. It's really cool. And uh, some things. And I, and I, they told me to go up to this table where these two lovely ladies were going to check me out. Not take the money, but just verify my purchases. And so, here's the deal. We go, and, uh, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm so glad to be here. I've lived in Innes Arden for two years, and I've found the clubhouse. I feel like I'm part of the community. This is so great. And so, there, and there's two ladies there, and I said, you know, I've been here over two years, I've lived in Innes Arden, and I've never known where the clubhouse is until today, and I'm so glad I found it, found you guys. This is just great. Howdy neighbor, you know, that kind of thing. And they said, well, don't you get the mailings and the invitations to all our special events? And I said, no, we never have. Oh, well, where do you live? We'll have to, and then I, I told them where I lived, and then the lady goes, well, what, what's your address? And I told her, 170312. Oh, don't put his name down. They're renters. <laughs> well, I know, Joan found the house for us. The only rental in Innes Arden, evidently. And this lady knew we were renters. And I, and, and I was going, oh, yeah, that's true. You know, the owners have been living in Bellevue, and we've been there for a couple of years now. Um, where do you live? I live two doors down from you. Oh, that's great, neighbor. That's fabulous. You're on the other side of Tim's house, and, and uh, I can just picture you there in your home. They're renters. <laughs> she was so disappointed. I'm feeling like crap, you know? <laughs> and and, I, and I was trying to be jovial, and then Eileen walks up with three blouses from the rummage sale. <laughs> Look what I found, two bucks. <laughs> these are going to be great. And said, You're wearing these cast-offs? And I just, I just feel, I'm just feeling myself getting more and more smaller and smaller. And now all the time I'm talking to her, people are coming up and saying, Hey, Joanna, da 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 you know, good to see you, Joanna. And so as I'm about to leave, I say, And, and what's your name, neighbor? My name is Johanna. And I said, what a coincidence. My name is Johan. <laughs> now, now, Kay told me, I, I went back to church feeling bad, you know, head down, oh, I'm a, I'm a renter, I'm a renter. And, and, and Kay said, you should have said it. What was it I should have said? I'm just living here until my house is finished in the Highlands. <laughs> I'm just living here until the house is finished in the Highlands. <laughs> well, Paul, in writing this passage, understands how we feel when people around us are putting us down, making us feel less, making us feel like we don't belong, that we're, we don't have value, right? And he's saying this is exactly the opposite of what Christ does where he breaks into our world and he says, no, you have infinite value. Mm -hmm. You have value. You are, you are loved. You're valued. You're known. You're cared for. You're nurtured. I'm with you always. Mm -hmm. He said, then these people come and make them feel like nothing. Says, That's wrong. Mm -hmm. And as we come uh, forward in our Christian lives, a lot of us have, have made a commitment to Christ, but we haven't made a commitment to the people around us to be giving out the ministry and the perspective that Jesus brings so that when, when people are with us, they should feel more value, more wise, more faithful, more courageous, more fun, more interesting, right? That's how we should feel. people should feel when they're around us. And... Uh, and he's saying, all my credentials, all the things that I could put up to say, look at how valuable I am. He says, I count it all dog droppings. That's what it is compared to knowing the love of Christ and knowing his, the power of his resurrection and having that relationship central in my life. That changes all of our perspective. I look at this and I go, that's what we need to have. Uh, many of you have been doing the Kingdom Challenge and I hope that as you go out, and you're spending this hundred bucks that came your way at very little cost, okay, <laughs> to you. And so, um, as you're doing this, that, that we would never 
use it in a way that people feel like they're the recipient of our charity. It's a, it's, it's a blessing and it's an honor that we, that we give to people. And, uh, uh, you know, Bruce Larson used to say all the time, if you want to honor somebody, ask them for help. Don't ask to help them. Ask them for help. And when we do that, they feel like, oh, you need my help. And uh, it, it reminded me we were um, on our way to, uh, to going through uh, Kazakhstan, on our way to Kyrgyzstan. I'm like, like there, that's a destination. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I can't wait till we get to Kyrgyzstan. That's going to be a lot different. And we're riding the chicken bus cross country, and it was really, uh, the chickens didn't even like it. Uh, but we were in the back, and it was obvious that everyone was Kazakh, and then there was this one tall, strong, blonde guy who was obviously Russian, who was in charge. And as we're riding along, uh, one of the guys from our church who went along as a translator spoke Russian and Kazakh, and so he was helping us. And uh, the Russian comes down the aisle, comes to me because I'm the old guy with the gray beard, you know, which is a sign of power or senility. And, um, and, and he starts talking to me in Russian really fast, and I'm going, ah, mm. this other guy, you know, talk to him. So he starts asking questions to this other guy about who we are, what we're doing there, what's going on. And, uh, and our friend from our church refuses to answer any of his questions. <clears throat> Instead, he taps a little old lady on the shoulder in front of him on the bus, and in Kazakh, asks if she speaks Russian, would she translate for him? And so he would respond to the Russians' uh, questions by talking to this little lady, and she would respond. The weirdest thing happened on this bus. The Russian guy was so angry because he wasn't getting direct answers from these foreigners. But all the Kazakh people on the bus were smiling and <laughs> joyful and turning, beaming at us because he asked for help of one of them and they spoke in their language, not the foreigner's language. And, and just that little thing of turning to this lady and asking if she would help us communicate made good friends of everybody on the bus but one. <laughs> And um, it, was, it was an amazing thing to watch. And so I want to encourage you, as you're going out and you're living out your faith, that you find ways to honor people by drawing them in and asking them for your help. And then they will feel better about themselves, not less about themselves, and, uh, and relationships get formed. Now, Paul says an interesting thing here. He gives up all those things. He gives up in order to know Christ personally, to experience his resurrection power, to be a partner of suffering, and to go all the way with him into death, he says. And then he said, now don't get me wrong. I haven't already attained it. Now, I grew up in a, in a mindset and a church where I thought once you accepted Christ, that was it. That was the destination, right? Anybody ever have that kind of mentality around them? I thought if I could just get it right, then my life would be good. And, and my relationships would work. Girls would like me, you know? My room would be clean. My parents wouldn't be on my case. You know, all of those things. And so because nothing changed out there, I thought that I just needed to keep asking Christ into my life over and over again, differently maybe, until I got it right. And I missed this whole concept that Paul's talking about here is that's just the start. The relationship starts like, okay, for example, anybody here ever get married? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm not asking if you still are. I'm not, you know, I'm not pushing it. I'm just saying, if you ever did or you ever thought about getting married. Okay, so what happens is, you know, that, that wedding, you know, I'm not making any eye contact with any of you. I'll just try to, that wedding, wasn't that the crowning glory and the, the sign that you'd really arrived in that relationship? Everything would be great from then on. Isn't that right? No. <laughs> You're actually saying no? You're saying no to me? You know, it, it's a funny thing because people think, oh boy, we get to that wedding and now we're married. Oh my goodness. What now? What now? And so, and then all of a sudden we go, oh, you know, now we've got to work on this thing. You know? <laughs> and uh, over the years, I, uh, I've done a bunch of weddings, you know, a bunch of them, people in this room even. And, uh, and uh, 
I found that nobody wants to talk about the work side of it before the wedding. And I, th I realized premarital counseling sucks. It is totally worthless. <laughs> it is completely worthless because everybody knows we're different. We're not like the others. You know, we love each other and everything's fascinating, you know. So, yeah, 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 pastor, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then like three months after the wedding, knock, knock, knock. John, can we come and see you? God, please, come on, we gotta get into this, this is horrible. <laughs> Now we should have listened. So I'm thinking we should only have post-wedding counseling. <laughs> you know, get out there and live a little bit. And then let's work on it, right? And what Paul's telling us here in Philippians 3 is, you accept Christ, whoopee. <laughs> now what? What are we going to do now? How are you going to live? How is your relationship with Christ going to change how you treat people? How is it going to change the decisions you make? How is it going to change how you live and, and, and work and worship and all those things? What difference will it make? I want to know the power of the resurrection. Yes. I want that. It's Without that, we're, we're nice people. Some, some are, you know, some not so. But um, we're people who've started. We're people who've had a wedding, but we don't have a marriage. You know, we're people who have made a commitment to Christ, but we haven't grown in him. We haven't walked with him. And, uh, you know, one of the things I love about you all here at Harvard Church is as we've been going through this journey together, this adventure, um, it's... Uh, it's been amazing to do this together and to, to experience the twists and the turns and the ups and downs. Somebody told me this morning before church, you know, I think I better get out of this church because everybody's dying. <laughs> <laughs> she, said, she said, you know, I came here because I wanted you to do my funeral, but I didn't think it happened so quick. <laughs> And I, and I thought, you know, that's really funny. Our church has been defined by the losses sometimes, you know, and uh, as we say goodbye to folks and, and, uh, and how we love each other through those transitions and losing parents and children and, and each other. And, um, and I'm going, that is real life, right? That's real life. That's not just some phony thing where we're going to go to church and, 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 and uh, talk superficially to each other around the donut table. Although it's fine to talk superficially around the donut table, but it, doesn't, it shouldn't be the whole deal. And then he says, okay, and I, I love this because this is a, so much like a Presbyterian pastor, you know, the way he says, one thing I do, and then he has three points. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, right? Looking forward to what's ahead. Three. I press on. I press on. That's one thing to Paul. Forgetting what I the turning away from the pains, the hurts, the celebrations, the credentials, or whatever it is that made us who we were, and looking forward to what's ahead that we can't control and we don't know what's coming, and then pressing forward. That's the one thing, isn't it? To take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. Right? I want to take hold of the very thing that's the purpose, that's the reason that, that, that Jesus took hold of me. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for me. It doesn't matter what Johanna thinks up in Innes Arden. I'm a renter. <laughs> Joan found us that house. That's a miracle house, you know. Yeah, so the thing is that uh, we forget that. We stop focusing on it and we, and we go forward. I really want to thank you for going forward with me and for helping me over these last couple of years to stop glaring back at the past. Man, I've been living in the rearview mirror when I met you. And you've helped me go, you know, there's a big windshield up there and that rearview mirror was so small. 
you know? And so now I can start looking out the windshield. And, and I owe that to you. So I uh, thank you for that. And I hope as we go forward, we go forward, right? I won't interrupt here. <laughs> yeah, so this church was just here for my healing. So, <laughs> but the thing is, let's do this together. And, and every person that we come across here or outside of here is going to feel more special. Amen. For Jesus living through us. Is that all right? Amen. Okay, let's, let's, let's stand and pray. So, Lord, we will do the one thing, all three parts of it, and give us the courage to not let others define us, to not let others uh, set the agenda or the vision, but help us press forward with you as you've taken hold of us. And so give us courage to trust you, to walk with you, and, and to experience joy because of you. That's our, that's our prayer, Jesus.